I should like for us to begin this morning in talking about the completeness of Christ and conversion, or conversion to Christ, as it is fully provided for in the completeness of Christ, with our looking at first verse 10 in chapter 2, and then dropping down for a moment and looking at verse 18 in chapter 2. In verse 10, again, we have Paul's affirmation where he says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Then in verse 18, he warns, along with the other warnings he had interspersed earlier in this chapter, Let no man beguile you of your reward, or as the Greek says, judge against you in regard to your reward, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind, and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. Paul indicates here his realization of the fact that sometimes Christians can be somewhat persuaded that Christ is not complete in every respect. That is, that he is not completely able to provide for them so that neither the Jews, nor we could say in our day, the Muslims have any particular thing to give to us or the Mormons, or anybody else for that matter, that nobody has anything else to give to us which Christ cannot provide for us and has not provided for us. Now, in this intervening passage here, from verse 10 down to verse 18, Paul points out some of those things which Christ has provided, or which we have received of the completeness of Christ, or as in Ephesians, the fullness of Christ, with which he fills his church fully with all that his church needs. These things were all provided for us, at least in germ, if not in full development, at the time we became followers of the Christ. So then, in beginning in verse 11, Paul says, In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Does any person say that we are lacking in this particular respect? Namely, we are lacking in regard to a circumcision and we need something which Christ has not given to us? Well, perish the thought. We're also circumcised by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye were risen with him to the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins, and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, does somebody say that uh, there's something to which we need to die for which Christ has not provided such a death or that there is some kind of new life which we need which we have not received as yet through Christ? Well, at the very time that Christ circumcised us, he also caused us to die to this old life which we no longer could possibly afford. And he gave us a new life with him. Does anybody say that there are any sins which we still have from the time of our conversion or before the time of our conversion to Jesus the Christ, which we need in some way to find forgiveness for? Well, no. At the time we turn to Christ, and obeyed his gospel, we had all of those trespasses that we had committed forgiven, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, 
and took it out of the way, nailing it to the, his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Does anybody say that there is some law which requires of us perfect obedience and yet which we've transgressed and that therefore this law has a writing of indictment against us that we are accused as criminals before God's law? Well, no, we don't have that problem anymore. Christ has provided for this too. Does anybody say that we need the law of Moses, for example, or we need some special ministration of angels or some such thing? Well, we don't. Christ has shown his superiority both to wicked angels and to even the angels of God. In fact, when he died on the cross, he removed the law which had been given by angels and he stripped them completely of their sort of intermediary function of the past in the giving of the law of Moses. And in every way he has shown his power and triumph even over angels. Therefore, we are not to be judged by men in regard to what the law of Moses says. Those things were simply a shadow to come. Now the body is of Christ. Do we, does anybody tell us the true substance has not yet come? That Christ has not adequately and fully been able to give us the real thing, the end thing, the ultimate thing? Why well, perish the thought? Everything that went before Christ was just the shadow. The body, the true reality, the true substance has now come. So that we should not permit anybody to teach us otherwise so that a judgment can be rendered against us and we will be deprived of our reward. We will be found wanting because we have not really believed in the completeness of Christ. Now this morning I just want to pick out uh, verses 11 through 13 for us to talk about in which Paul weaves together two tremendous figures of speech to show us what Christ has been able to do for us. Man's predicament can be presented from the viewpoint of various figures of speech. And of course the Bible does this very thing. One of our problems is that we have sinned against God. And in sinning against God, God has cut us off. God, who is the only source of life, has cut us off. Not right now from physical life, but he's cut us off from himself so that we are dead for all that counts. In Ephesians chapter 4, Paul indicates how this had come about and the fact that we are cut off from the life of God when he says, at the time that we were Gentiles, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Here Paul indicates that it's only in fellowship with God as we have the favor of God that we have spiritual life with God. As Gentiles, and I suppose that most of these Colossian Christians were Gentiles, as Gentiles, they had been blinded by the common thinking of the Gentile world insofar as God and His will were concerned. They had thought that they could live one way when God told them to live another way. Thus, they were transgressors of God's will. God was angry with their transgressions. His wrath was directed toward them. He cut them off from himself, so to speak, so they are cut off from the source of life. Well, that's our one problem, or one way of speaking of our problem. Another way of speaking of our problem is, man, I'll tell you, when you commit a sin, it just sticks to you like that. I get sometimes things that stick to me, and some things just come off very easily. Other things don't come off so easily. For example, can you imagine the problem of someone who'd been tarred and feathered? 
It's such a revolutionary days getting the tar off. Tar wants to come off only with your skin, and then some. Now that's the way sin is, or much more so. Sin sticks to you more closely and firmly than anything else possibly can stick to you. Sin can stick to you closer than your brother can. But boy, you, you just you want to get rid of it, and you just can't do it. Now, sometimes we have growths, you know, on the surface of our bodies and maybe somewhat uh, down into the skin, too. For example, just recently, a few day days ago, my grandson in Texas, who's about 9 or 10, I can't keep track of their ages, had a growth here in his neck. It's a lump growing in his neck or in his throat here. And apparently it had tied into the back of his throat and his pituitary gland. And they even then when they took it out, found it, you know, its roots into the bone there. Now, I'll tell you, uh, our hope is this, that since they took it out, it won't come back. But we can cut these little ugly things that sprout up on our bodies. And the older you get, the more these little sprout up things you get. Now, I don't know about your bodies, but I got little... These, some of these little red blood blisters that my brother had too before me and I suppose my father and a few little other things, weird shapes pop out on me and uh, I think, boy, I'd like to cut those off. Well, what happens is when you cut some of them off, they just come right back. You just can't get rid of it. It sends that way. Once you get it on you, once you get it on your soul, once you become blackened and filthy with sin, you just can't get it off. You can scrub and scrub anyway, physically or morally, and you just don't get it off. Well, now, with these two figures of speech, the situation with us sinners before we were saved by Christ, the Apostle Paul wants to show us in Colossians chapter 2 that Jesus is able to take a man who is dead spiritually and make him alive. And you can't do more to a dead man than make him alive. That's the full story. And you can't take a sinner and do anything more for a sinner than pardon him or get rid of his sins. And here the figure of circumcision, a cutting off, is used to indicate figuratively what Christ does for us in providing for the forgiveness of our sins. Here in this passage in Colossians 2, 11 through 13, Paul is looking at four things that had taken place in their past in their conversion. First, he looks at their state before their conversion, which we have in a nutshell described. In the second place, he looks at what God or Christ figuratively did for them in these two powerful figures of speech, of circumcising and raising to life. Third, he looks at the literal means God or Christ employed to bring about these dramatic changes. And in the fourth place, he looks at the finished result right at the time that one was converted to Christ. Let's look at verse 13, wherein Paul indicates what they were like before they became Christians and what they were like after they became Christians. He said, and you being dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh. Now, here were the two problems. We were dead in our sins, and our flesh, so far as our sins were concerned, was uncircumcised. Now, what did God do for these Christians who one time had been dead and uncircumcised, he quickened them together with Christ. Now, the word quickens, an old English word meaning made alive. They were dead in their sins, and he solved that problem completely. He made them alive. They had their sins on them. Their sins had not been cut off. They were uncircumcised. And what did Christ do? He cut their sins off, or literally, he forgave their sins, so their sins were no longer on them. Now Paul, in verse 11 and verse 12, looks at what God did from two figurative viewpoints in bringing about this change, or in bringing about a person 
you know, becoming Christ, a Christian or a follower of Jesus. He says in verse 11, In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Now there is in Christianity a circumcision. However, it's a figurative or spiritual circumcision. It is not a literal circumcision. God gave to Abraham, as Acts 7, verse 8 said, the covenant of circumcision. And we can turn to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 17, and we can read about this literal, physical, material circumcision that God gave to Abraham and to Abraham's seed. In Genesis 17, 14, God says to Abraham that there are two classes of persons whom he must circumcise, namely those born in his house and those born with his money. And in their flesh, they will be circumcised and have the sign of the covenant. Well, we're not talking about this circumcision. We're talking about another circumcision, a circumcision which is figurative, and spiritual. In Philippians chapter 3, as Paul thinks about the danger which Judaizers have everywhere presented to the disciples of Christ, and as he thinks about their spiritual arrogance, he gets somewhat sarcastic and ironical in verse 2 and says, Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the concision or the mutilators. Notice the similarity in form between concision and circumcision. And of course, the same similarity is in the Greek. Circumcision means a cutting around and a rather careful cutting around too. Whereas, Concision means a mutilation. Now the Judaizers went around saying, so long as you Gentile believers in Jesus refuse to be circumcised, you continue as dogs and not as the people of God. And you are doing evil and not good. And you are without the circumcision which you need. Paul says, these are the dogs. They have de jewed themselves. In fact, so far as the full meaning of being a Jew is concerned by insisting upon the status of a Jew which is unimportant, which is irrelevant anymore. And rather than doing good, which they trumpet so much, they are the evil doers. And rather than really circumcising Gentiles, they are mutilating them and doing a thing the pagans would do to people or pagan Gentiles had do that done. They were not really making a truly circumcised people. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. To people who in the flesh were not circumcised, they did not have the kind of circumcision which the Judaizers insisted upon. Paul says, we are the circumcision. And he gives three outstanding characteristics of us. We worship God in the Spirit. We glory in Christ Jesus. And we have no confidence in the flesh as these, these, these Judaizers do. He says, now he one time had confidence in the flesh. And in verse 5 he indicates to us one of the initial things of his life which would stand in his list of a fleshly pedigree, which would be so pleasing to Judaizers, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. He himself had been circumcised one time in the flesh, and one time he gloried in this circumcision, thought it was a mark of the only true people of God. But now he knows that anybody who puts this mark upon someone is mutilating that person in a pagan kind of ecstatic experience. 
rather than giving him the mark of the true people of God. We are the circumcision. I guess my time is getting away, so I won't look at all these New Testament passages talking about circumcision. It's amazing, though. Maybe you can find the passage. You know, Ephesians so often follows along with Colossians. I don't mean just step by step. But it'll say something about the same subject, often in a somewhat different context, though, and maybe in a somewhat different application. I find where Ephesians has a magnificent discussion of being raised to life with Christ and sitting with Christ in heavenly places, for by grace are you saved. Ephesians 2, 1, you know, through 8 or so. But I haven't found any passage yet where Paul in Ephesians talks about some kind of spiritual circumcision akin to the way he does here in Colossians. But there is the circumcision of Christ. And, of course, what the idea is that we can't tear our sins from us. We can't cut our sins off. Only Christ can come to us and cut away our sins and dispose of them so they are no longer upon us. Then, this took place also in Colossians chapter 2 when you were buried with him in circumcision, I mean buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So we were buried, died to our old life, we were buried to our old life, and now we have been risen with Christ. Now, what are the specific or literal means this passage refers to whereby these physically, these, these spiritually wonderful things come about? Well, there are two basic things Paul refers to here. He refers to faith in the operation of God who raised Jesus from the dead, and he refers to baptism, water baptism. Now, both of these things are very literal things. Faith is literal faith. Baptism is literal water baptism. Well, let's look at these and see how he explains them for us or how he fits them into the pattern of what he's talking about here. Now, in verse 11, we're not told specifically, you know, when Christ circumcises us, or in what particular literal act, if there be such, in which Christ circumcises us. But he indicates that it takes place at the same time when we are buried with him in baptism, and we are raised with him through or by means of faith in the operation of God. And that's the first thing I really want to emphasize here. To have our sins cut off from us so we are no longer accountable for them, or to be raised from a death in sins, the first thing is we've got to have faith in God. But he says, faith in the operation or working of God. Now, when I first began to realize what this passage was thinking, I thought he was talking about the circumcision it was a divine operation, and God was doing it on the sinner through Christ, and that therefore, for me to have my sins forgiven by God, I've got to believe that he has the power to forgive my sins. Well, of course, that's obvious. That's why we go to God or Christ, because we believe that they are our Savior. <clears throat> Only God or Christ can forgive our sins. And certainly, circumcision is a working or an operation. But that's not what Paul's talking about. This operation will take place automatically, irresistibly, if we have faith in the proper operation of God. Now, what great thing did God do or what great working did he perform which becomes the basis for everything and becomes the means or the power whereby God is able to save us? He raised Christ from the dead. And that's what he's talking about. That working in regard to the dead Christ is exactly the working that is powerful enough to take us who are dead in sins and make us alive. Or it's powerful enough to be able to cut our sins off from us so that we no longer are accountable to these sins. 
In Ephesians chapter 1, Paul talks about the tremendous power of God to which we must have our eyes opened. As Brother Curry's been trying to tell us through James and through Paul that we cannot live successfully in this world if our faith is not big enough to make the world small enough so we can overcome the world. Or as Paul also might say in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, although it's off my point here, that our hearts often are restricted. You're straightened in yourself, said Paul, all pinched up. Our mouth is open unto you. Our heart is enlarged. Your heart needs to be large enough to receive us too. But So we're often too small in our faith and we're too small in our heart or our love too. But in this case, look at what Ephesians 1 says, beginning in verse 1. Pardon me, verse 18. This is what Paul is praying for them. He says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints and what. Here are three great what's we need to be able to see. We need to be able to have our eyes open to. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his right hand, etc. Do we believe that God raised Christ from the dead? Yes. Do, you, do we believe that it was God's almighty power which raised Christ from the dead? Yes, and he did so for us to make Christ our Savior? Why, yes. Well, Paul tells us we've got to have our eyes open to something else too. That same power is now working toward us to bring about our salvation. And whenever we come to gospel obedience, we are being baptized, we are doing so because we believe that God raised Christ from the dead and made him our Savior. And that becomes the faith in the operation of God which gives vitality to this life to which we are being raised and gives power to the knife that Christ uses, so to speak, to cut our sins away from us. In Romans chapter 10, verses 8 through 11, Paul says, But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. That is the word of faith which we preach, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. In this passage in Romans 10, both righteousness, right standing before God, and salvation, being saved from one's sins, mean the same thing. Just as here in Colossians 2, being raised to this new life with Christ and having one's sins cut off from one so one is truly the circumcised, all mean to have the forgiveness of sins. But in both contexts, it is through faith in the operation of God who raised Christ from the dead that we have the power that gives any meaning to this experience in baptism. So now we come to baptism. It was when you were buried in baptism. And at that time you had faith in the operation of God that you were raised to, a, to life and that you had your Christ performed his circumcision on you. Now in regard to baptism, often people at this point make two perversions of baptism. Some say, hey, this is Holy Ghost baptism because the circumcision is made without hands. And the circumcision is baptism. Water baptism is done with hands. So it can't be water baptism. It's got to be Holy Ghost baptism made without hands. Well, the mistake here is that baptism is not itself circumcision. I don't know how you make that. I guess you just put one line there. Anyway, baptism is not circumcision. That's not what Paul says. Paul says a circumcision takes place in baptism. Baptism is one thing and the circumcision is another thing 
But the circumcision so essential to salvation takes place when one is baptized. Now, baptism is performed by human hands, but the forgiveness of sins which takes place when we are baptized is a divine act, wholly a divine act, the act of Christ, and not the act of man. Christ cuts off our sins wholly apart from any human action which is helping him in this matter. It's his own work and his own work exclusively, and he alone has the power to forgive sins. So the baptism is not without hands. It's the circumcision, the saving act of Christ, which is without hands. Then the pedo-baptist says, Aha, this is what I've been looking for and I've been telling you. We're supposed to baptize infants today. In the Old Testament, infants born into the family of believers were circumcised to have the sign and seal of the covenant. Today, since baptism has come in the place of circumcision, children of members of the covenant are to have their children or babies or infants baptized because baptism comes in the place of circumcision. Well, it's the same mistake the charismatic makes. Paul nowhere says that baptism comes in the place of circumcision. What he says is we have both. It's not either or. One time we had circumcision, and now we have baptism, which comes in the place of circumcision. Today we have both baptism and circumcision. The baptism is literal. The circumcision is spiritual. The two come together when... We are baptized for the remission of sins or to have our sins forgiven. We obey God's command or Christ's command by submitting to baptism. At that time, Christ keeps his faithful promise and forgives our sins or cuts them off or gives us the spiritual life whereby God will acknowledge us. And we are no longer alienated from the life of God, but we are joined to God, the source of all life. Now, if we would take in the New Testament all the passages that put baptism, even John's baptism, in the same passage with being saved or being in God's kingdom or being cleansed or being forgiven or anything equivalent to salvation, what we'll find is that in every one of those passages, baptism is always mentioned before the forgiveness of sins before cleansing because one is in the act of being baptized and that's when the saving takes place. What people often want to do is to find passages which talk not about baptism at all to show the purpose of baptism. They find passages talking about salvation in relationship to other conditions of salvation and these passages, since they don't specifically mention baptism, must be teaching that baptism is not essential to salvation. Why, no. You find in a passage on faith as a condition to salvation the purpose of faith and the relationship that salvation plays to faith. You do not find anything about salvation and baptism. That's almost like going to the encyclopedia and wanting to know about automobiles, but you look up airplanes, or you look up trains, or something else. You can, you can know a lot about what the encyclopedia says about trains, or airplanes, or guns, etc. And you can say, well, I read that whole article about trains, and it didn't say a thing about automobiles, therefore it didn't have any, doesn't say anything about automobiles, or doesn't think automobiles are important. Oh, well, that's not the way you do it. God, when he's talking about faith, tells us, the value and purpose of faith. When he talks about baptism, he gives us the importance and purpose of baptism. And here he is, has said so clearly that it can't be missed what he says in every such passage, that the salvation follows upon baptism or really takes place in the act of baptism. And what's the result? Well, so far as our death in sins is concerned, we have been made alive. I wish I had the time to talk about how the Old Testament uses circumcision because 
Even the Old Testament uses circumcision in a figurative spiritual way too. For example, Moses is in a great Moses in his great speeches on the plains of Moab <coughs> twice told the Israelites that they had to be circumcised, that they were all circumcised. Or if they weren't and were circumcised, I guess, when they crossed the Jordan, that's not the kind of circumcision Moses was talking about. They would soon, I guess, do that. But the circumcision was a circumcision in the heart. It was to put off the foreskin of their heart, and he says, be no more stiff-necked. Now, that's not the same circumcision we're talking about here in Colossians, although it's akin to it. It is a spiritual circumcision. This must be true of us, too. And so if we just want to be, you know, technical, we really need two circumcisions. You know, my heart is often hard and stubborn, and I'm often determined to do my own thing. I need some cutting off there, but that's something I've got to do. God won't do that for me except that he'll slap me around a little bit to soften me up so I'll do my own circumcising so far as that's concerned. I must humble myself before God. I myself must change my will and repent of my sins. That's how the Old Testament uses circumcision in a spiritual or figurative sense. But much more than my having to cut off my own stubborn attitude, my own willful way, I must submit to God's cutting off my sins because only He can do that. This baptism of the New Testament, this circumcision of the New Testament then is a greater circumcision than even that absolutely essential Old Testament circumcision of the circumcision of the heart. The Bible uses various figures of speech about what God does to our sins. He blots out the record that says we're sinners and it's gone. Our credit has revived we are children of God. Or God sends our sins away. Or as in this case, you know when the priest or the parent circumcised the foreskin of the male and took the foreskin, they threw the foreskins, so to speak, behind their back or they threw them away. Isaiah foresees the day in Isaiah 38, 17 when God, when God will cast our sins behind his back and he won't peek back there anymore. He'll never see them again. They're behind his back. Now, that's what Jesus has done for us. He has come to us and taken our sins and cut them off and cast them behind his back, and they are gone so far as we are concerned and so far as he is concerned. Christ completely saves. He doesn't leave a single sin. Those sins never grow back again. Once our sins are forgiven in our turning to Christ, on the day of judgment, Christ may bring up some sins that we've committed, but he'll never bring up one of those sins again. They are completely gone, and we are completely alive. We'll never get sick and feeble and die again because of those sins. We've been quickened. We've been made alive. We've had all of our sins forgiven. I recall one day talking to a denominational person. said, now look, Denominational people often believe, like John Calvin, that you're justified once for all. The moment you're saved, God forgives all your sins, even your future sins as well as your past sins. So how can you be lost? Well, that'd be true. If God forgives all of your sins that you'll ever commit, as well as the ones you have committed, certainly you couldn't be lost. He quoted Colossians 2.13, Having forgiven you all your trespasses. But Paul's not talking here about all the sins that someday they might be guilty of. He's talking about all the ones they were guilty of when they turned to Christ. And every single one of those was forgiven. We are eternally secure from the past sins that we committed before we obeyed the gospel. Those sins will never be brought up again. And we'll never be asked to account for them or to explain them. Of course, as we Christians know from the teaching of the New Testament, if we commit sins after we turn to Christ, we've got to get Christ to forgive those sins for us too. But when it came to our becoming Christians, there was no lack. Did we need a circumcision? Oh, yes. Well, Christ himself performed that circumcision on us. Did we need to die to the old life and be raised to the new life with Christ? Oh, yes. But Christ took care of that too. Did we need the oppressive law of Moses or such a law taken away so we wouldn't have to answer God on those terms? Oh, yes. Christ took that away for us. 
we are complete in him. And we will not hear the eloquent words of men not holding the head from whom the whole body gets nourishment and increases with the increase of God. I say we will not hear that person who does not adhere to the headship of Christ and the completeness of Christ and would any way persuade us to believe that Christ in some way is deficient and we are lacking in some important respect.